So we're going to spend some time looking at those. Uh, if you've gotten a lesson, uh, take a look at that lesson. You'll notice there are two sides. So this class is going to get out about 10 o'clock tonight. <laughs> no, it's going to go two or three weeks. But I want you to hold on to the lesson because we'll use over half of it next week. So Danny is passing them out back there to make sure you get one. If you don't have one, raise your hand. He'll get one to you. Uh, it doesn't have the answers filled in, so make sure you got a pencil so you can follow along. And uh, we really need to spend some time tonight looking at the our prayer list. And in just a few moments, uh, Scott's going to lead us in our prayer. But we know there's a lot of prayer requests. Uh, and Sue told me that, uh, and I think it was talking about today. Did she go home yesterday, Debbie Campbell? Or today? Today. She's home. Yeah, that's good. A uh, little bit better. Doing a little better. Um, you know, she's been through a lot. So let's let's keep her in our prayers. and As well as praying for David. He's out of town in Oklahoma. He'll be back soon. Uh, but make sure you, you pray for Debbie and David. Yes, Rick? Oh, you need a handout? I don't need a microphone. You need a microphone? I don't. You don't? Just pretend like I have one. <laughs> He's got a microphone. My Go. greatest nephew is 21. He's a senior at Michigan State University. Oh. He's 10 feet from the sky. 10 feet from the murderer. There's a half wall between us. There's a beam. be praying for the, all the students, but especially those that were affected and killed and maimed and the families that need comfort right now. Wow. And let's pray for him. What's his name? Brett. Brett. Okay, let's pray for Brett. Uh, it, a traumatic ordeal like that, he's going to be struggling with this for a long time. And uh, I'm sure the rest of us. Yes, yes. So Scott will not only remember David and Debbie, but also Brett. Yes, Sue? I think you were telling me that Nora took a fall. Nora took a fall. Oh. And she's always here. So we know she's hurting. Nora? Wow. Let's be praying for Nora. Yes. Oh, and the good news, uh, I've asked prayers for my daughter Cheryl for the last couple of Wednesdays and because she had a bruise on her left lung. Yeah, we were praying. It, it turns out that uh, they compared that to x-rays taken in 2017 and it hasn't changed any. So thank, thank you for the prayers. And, yeah. And keep it up. That, that, that was really good news. Wow. That's a good praise report. Yeah, it is. Thank you. We need to hear some of those, you know. Offset the, the tragic and tragedies that we hear about that Rick just shared with us a moment ago. Anyone else have a, a prayer request? Charlie, yeah, Charlie. I had a story on the call yesterday afternoon. Uh, my wife had COVID, but no symptoms. And so she no symptoms, but she has COVID? Yeah, Bob? I think my niece, uh, Laura, on the only email I'm prepared. She had surgery to go to the original today. And then uh, just today, another alternative procedure was suggested. So she did the take of turmoil now as to whether to proceed with the basic surgery or to consider another pathway to healing. Wow. We'll be praying for her. Laura's decision. Let's pray that, that the decision is cut, clear cut so she doesn't have to make any hard decisions. That's a good thing to pray for is just, Lord, 
help help her so that it doesn't have to be a, a major decision that's going to put pressure on her. George? Derailment? Yeah. That's tragic. Let's continue praying for the people of Ukraine. Uh, they're going through a lot of tragic and tragedy and trauma. Unbelievable. Let's pray for them. And uh, anyone else before Scott leads us in prayer? What's that? The lost and new babes in Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, and after that, Joe's going to lead us in some songs. Why don't you lead us, Scott? Let's, let's pray together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're grateful to be here tonight, Father. And we come before you tonight with a prayer of thanks, Father. We thank you for the way that you bless us every, each and every day, for the way that you love on us, for the way that you keep us safe, for the way that you answer prayers. Father, for the prayers of praise, like the one Larry mentioned, Father, and others uh, in this room, we're just so grateful for the way that you uh, listen to us, the way that you love on us, Father. We're grateful for that. Father, we Amen. have a list of names that were mentioned tonight that we lift before you. You know each and every name, Father. I did not write them down, but I know I'm, I'm pretty confident that you know who they are. Father, we have some who are waiting to get out of the hospital, and we would ask for quick healing. We have some who have been released and are home recovering. We have others who are battling COVID, some who are battling cancer. We have some of our number who are waiting for test results and some that have received test results. Father, we have many that are traveling. We have some that will be heading back soon to the north. Father, we pray for all the things that these people mentioned here tonight need, whether it's healing or patience or perseverance or calm. Father, we pray for those things. We pray for this church as we strive to do your will. We pray, Father, for the Neal family. We pray, Father, for those in Turkey, those in the Ukraine, those involved in the train derailment, those involved in the Michigan shooting. Father, so much going on in the world, so many problems. And Father, we pray that you would keep your people safe. Be with Russ tonight as he brings us a lesson and bring him recollection of the things he came here to say. Be with our ladies group as they study the word, our teens and our children. And Father, be with us and continue to love on us the way you do until we come together again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 450, 450. Mm. Uh, da, 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 da. Sound familiar? Mm. Tell me. Give me the Bible, star of gladness gleaming to cheer the wandering lone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that radiance peaceful beaming since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and Give me the prize. 
I too guy. Four forty nine. You know, I've never led this song. You, can you do this one, Dennis? I know the Amy Grant song. I don't. I don't know if this is the same thing as. <laughs>
born in 19... <laughs> 93? Hey, Joe, what page was that? Oh, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> Fran will tell you. She's been telling everybody. Okay. What a, I forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. It's been a great day. I'm glad to be alive and uh, breathing. So that's a good thing, right? Uh, we've been uh, wanting to start a series called How to Study the Bible. And so tonight, if you don't have a handout, please raise your hand. Danny has them set back there. Um, I want to start out by asking you, raise your hand if you've ever, have any of you been to hell? Uh, that's not the right way to put it. Hell, Michigan. Yeah. Okay. One person. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, that's right. Hell, Michigan. That's usually what it looks like in February. Um, it's freezing were you there in the summer or winter? <laughs> I was there in the summer. It's always summer. The summer. Was it hot? <laughs> Rick? I've been there three times. Three times? Wow. Oh, okay. I don't know how to take that. A lot of people don't know how to take this, this uh, uh, slide. It can be a little bit frightening to think about this. I, I thought about it. And then I saw this on the internet. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> that sounds about right, doesn't it? Oh. And then, uh, this is what I like to remind my kids. I know Fran's eyes are rolling right now, but people don't know in Michigan that these round bales of hay are outlawed. Did any of you know that? Well... They found out the cows weren't getting three square meals a day. Oh, so, no, no, no. I can get away with that because I'm old, okay? Uh, our study is how we got the Bible. You know, I, I want all of you to pick up your Bible. Please pick it up in your lap and, and look at it. And I want you to look at, take a look at the spine. Take a look at the spine. What's that? Oh, his Bible's on his phone. Take a look at the side of your phone, okay? Uh, but look at the spine on your Bible. And tell me what it says. Tell me what it says. What's your say? Rick? It tells you how many times you've opened it. That's true. You can tell whether a person's opened their Bible, can't you? What What is your say? David, what is your say on the spine? Mine, just, mine says study Bible. Study Bible. Okay, is there anything else? That's HCSB. HCSB. Is there any name on it? It's the Holy Home of Christian. No, that's it. Okay, no Holy Bible on it. Okay. You got my phone. Will it? Mine says Apple. It says Apple. <laughs> Apple Bible. Willie, do you have, what's your say? Holy Bible. Anything else? Okay, anybody else? Bible. Holy Bible. English Standard Version. English Standard Version. That's a good version. Anybody else? What's that? King James? Okay. New King James. Anybody else? Uh, the reason I ask you that is because it, it's, you wouldn't believe how many different Bibles our, our students have at Rochester College. When they come to class for a Bible Lit class, they don't understand what that book is. And they don't understand where it came from. In fact, they don't even know what Holy Bible means. Uh, we know that, that holy in Greek is hagios. I call it hagios, but my professor would die if he heard me say that. Hagios, he would say. Uh, you, you mispronounced it. Hagios. Uh, and Bible is just a, a Latin word, biblios, which means a collection of books. And so a lot of the students think that God put that title on my Bible, on that book. He didn't, did he? It's a human invention. Holy Bible didn't come from God. The book did, but the title 
was something we put on there. It's like Good Samaritan. Jesus never called him a Good Samaritan. He's just a Samaritan. But we put that title in there, you know, so we know where the parable starts. Oh, the Good Samaritan parable. Um, so my students will, will wonder, well, I just thought it was a book that God gave us. Some of them literally think that the Bible came down from heaven. In a figurative way, it did, but they think it just appeared. And they don't understand the history behind the collection. Um, holy Hagias. What, what does holy mean? Do you have any ideas on what holy means, first of all, before we talk about Bible or Biblios? Set apart. Set apart, yeah. Set apart. This, how is the Bible set apart? It's holy. It's separate. It's, it's like no other book, isn't it? It's like no other book in the world. And that's why it earns the title holy, separate. The Bible is still the number one book sold every year in the world. Um, many of you don't know number two, do you? It's called In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. I think I mentioned it here before. Uh, in His Steps is a book about this preacher in a church who challenged his church to spend their time acting like Jesus. Every decision you make, think about what, what would Jesus do? Of course, we came out with a bracelet uh, 30 years ago, but Charles Sheldon wrote a book in his steps in 1901. It's old, it's old, but it's still the number two selling book in the world. Um, but isn't it interesting that the word holy, meaning separate, it's different from any other book. Biblios just means a collection of books. Holy books, Biblios. Um, so we have not one book in the Holy Bible. It's 66 books in that book that we hold in our hands. Uh, it's not an all-inclusive one book. It's 66 books. And so... These discussions are good for students coming into Bible classes for them in the, on the university level to understand, you know, why the Bible, what happened to bring about the Bible? What's it all about? Um, and why do we carry it? I, I, I remember the day, I was a senior in high school, 19, I should say, and we had a book, a, a, a class called Bible Literature. And so we brought our Bibles to school, in high school. And I was so happy to take that class because I wanted to carry my Bible, but I wasn't very brave, you know, carrying the Bible through the halls of my high school. But then all of us students in that class carried our Bibles. Well, our teacher, Ms. Ramsey, taught the Bible saying that this book is just a collection of oral stories that the rabbinic writers wrote down millenniums ago. So she was not ready to admit that this is from the hand of God through the Holy Spirit. It was just a collection of oral stories. And you know, you know how oral stories change. Eventually it got to where there was a flood and a big ark and all the animals got. So she taught it like it was literature and that it was just a human invention. Um, we had a lot of discussions in that class. And it was disturbing to be a a 17-year-old and hearing those things. I'd never heard that before, but that was her thought. So I, I find different students that a lot of the college students have never discussed the, where did it come from? Where, you know, we sing, our kids grow up singing, um, oh, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. They grow up singing that. The more we read the Bible, the Bible, the Bible, the more we read the Bible, the happier we'll be. We learn about Jesus. I'm not going to sing it because that's the flat rock version. I'm not sure what the Naples version is. Uh, but we sing about the Bible. You know, we grow up, I grew up singing about the Bible. It's always been a holy book to me, and I've always felt, you know, that it came from God. You read 2 Timothy, you know it's God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. 
You learn that he, he, he tells us to study the word of God, 2 Timothy. And so these, these things are just things that we grew up with. But a lot of the students that come to Rochester have never been exposed to the Bible. In fact, not many of them really look forward to the class. And so my, my assignment is to get them to fall in love with this book before they leave the, the university so that they can fall in love with it like we are. We're all in love with this book, aren't we? It's, it's amazing. In fact, a lot of them don't know the divisions. And when they learn that there's the Pentateuch or the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that they don't understand that those are the books of law. And then after Deuteronomy, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And, and they don't know the books of history that division. Then they don't know the, the books of poetry, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They don't understand those divisions, those three divisions that make up the law and the history and the poetry. And so this is all new to them. They're learning, wow, this is a whole world, you know, and not knowing what the Pentateuch or the Torah is to the Jews and how they memorize it by the time they're 14 years old. That's incredible to me, uh, that they were able to memorize the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, uh, like that, and know it by heart. Um, I've often thought that, and my, one of my professors mentioned that our Torah is the first five books of the New Testament. Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. That's our Torah. And we spend a lot of time there, don't we? And uh, they just don't know the division, so they're, they're happy to learn all this material about the way that the Bible's put together and its different divisions. And then they don't realize that the prophets are not in chronological order. They don't understand that. They think, well, isn't the Bible, you know, by year, by century? And then they realize, oh, the, they're organized by size. We have Isaiah... Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi is the shortest. They don't understand it. They're in length order. And uh, the minor, the minor prophets are not minor prophets because they're less important. It's just their size. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. And so they, they come away thinking, you know, I've never known this because either their church doesn't teach it or they haven't been to church or they haven't learned the names of the books of the Bible. Um, it's a whole new world that opens up to them. And it's incredible to see the light go on. Wow, there's something there. And then, and then to learn that the, that the world began and God desired to have a relationship with families. And he began with Adam and Eve and all the way to Abraham. He tried to, he tried to arrange to have a relationship with families and families and families. And it didn't work out. And then he said, okay, I'm going to have a relationship with a nation. We're going to, we're going to try and have a relationship with the Israelites, the Jews. So he began having, trying to have a relationship with a Jewish nation. So he went from family center to nation-centered, did that work? No. So he said, okay, I'm going to send my son. Or I'm going to have a relationship with the church. This is it. He went from family to nation, and now the church. This is it. There's no other plan. He wants to have a relationship with us, with the church. And so that's, that's an overview of the Bible. And when, you, when I try to tell him, you know, this is a survey class, we're not going to get deep, but we have to learn the overview of the Bible to understand the underlying message from God. And it's so much fun to see these young people uh, learn this and, and internalize it and really, really get to know the Bible a little bit. Uh, I, I, it's been my experience, though, to get to know some people in this world that really get to know the Bible. Um, 
one of the greatest people in the world who knows the Bible better than just about anybody. Have you ever heard of a lady named Joni Erickson Todd? Have you? Okay. Have you read about her? If you haven't read about her, you need to read or listen to her online. She is amazing. Uh, they call her Johnny. I call her Joni. It's hard for me to call a girl Johnny, but it's J-O-N-I, uh, Erickson Todd. And she, uh, when she was 17, she dove into the Chesapeake Bay and broke her neck and uh, spends the rest of her life in a wheelchair. And uh, she is so inspirational. She is amazing, just amazing. They ask her, uh, what does she do to keep her spirit? Because she's such a positive person in a wheelchair, a quadriplegic, you know. And she says, well, I, my husband and I quote the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, in the car. They just quote the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that was amazing to me. They just quote the Sermon on the Mount, not separate verses. Now, she knows a lot of Bible, let me tell you. You listen to her speak, she saturates her word with scripture all the time. And amazing, just amazing to me. Uh, and they ask her, when did you get over your bitterness over being a quadriplegic? And she said, well, she was out with some friends and they were watching the sunset from the boardwalk on the, on the ocean. And a ranger came up and told them, you kids get out of here, there's no loitering here. And you put that wheelchair back where you got it. <laughs> and she was sitting there and she said, I can't get out of it. And she, he said, you heard me, put it away, put it back where you got it. She said, this is my wheelchair. And then he realized she really was using that wheelchair and they were wheeling her. And her friend said that night, uh, they had prayer before they went to bed and they said, Joni, that's the first time we ever heard you say, my wheelchair. And it changed her life. She was over her bitterness. In fact, until 2020, she has given away 200,000 wheelchairs. Not just in this country, but in Africa, India. She travels the world giving away wheelchairs. And it's funny because in her book she says, she said, when I go to heaven, I'm going to take my wheelchair. <laughs> and she said, uh, I know that's not theological right, but she says, I'm going to get out of my wheelchair and stand before Jesus Christ, and I'm going to get on my knees and say, I know that you told me that life is going to be hard, and it was, but you showed me how to get through it on the cross. And then she said, I'm going to tell him, would you please send this wheelchair to hell? I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> and so she has this great attitude about what she's been doing and what she's been. He said, how do you stay humble, Johnny? And she said, well, in the morning, I don't have trouble staying humble because she's so famous and she's sold so many books. She said, in the morning, when they come in to get me out of bed, she said, they take care of my toiletries, they irrigate my catheter, and they take care of me, and she said, let me tell you, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. She said, I get humbled every morning when somebody takes care of me. And she said, he asked her, well, how do you, how do you get so much joy? And she says, we have a funny home. She says, my, my husband, who I've been married to for 30 years, she said, you should see him try to put lipstick on me in the morning. She says, he holds it out front and I try to, I'm like a plane coming off the runway. I'm trying to get, get my head onto the lipstick. And she said, so we laugh all morning when she's getting ready. But she, she's the kind of person who, who not only prays so much, but she also sings a lot because the singing really helps her. You know, a lot of people try to tell her, okay, if you just read this verse, or if you just go to this Bible study, you'll, you'll, you'll come out of it. You'll, you won't be bitter anymore. And she said, people don't need to hear that. She said, a lady came over one time to visit her and bring her some supper, and she, she came into her home, and she started singing a song. And this is the song that changed her. 
When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well my soul. Ladies, it is well. Men, ladies, it is well, it is well with my soul. If you ever want to witness someone who knows scripture better than anybody I've ever heard. Listen to Johnny. She'll tell you what it's like to learn the Bible and scripture. I did want to begin by telling you the journey of any preacher is, is difficult at the beginning because you, because you have to learn the difference between exegesis and hermeneutics. Exegesis is just what did it mean? In other words, exegesis is, what did Scripture mean back then when it was written? What did 1 Corinthians mean when Paul wrote it in the first century? Hermeneutics is, what does it mean to us today in 2023? We've got to take the exposition of the Scripture and then bring it forward a couple thousand years. What does God want me to do with this Scripture? Um, if you spend any time at all reading about the miracles of the Bible, you'll learn that a lot of blind people were given their sight. And almost every single time, Jesus was trying to teach them, you are spiritually blind. You need to learn what it's like to open your eyes. I'm opening their eyes. Now you need to open your eyes spiritually. So he's trying to teach them over and over, you know. How do we understand scripture back then? And you know what? I found that there's a lot of people, maybe even in this church, that need to have their eyes open spiritually. Right? Don't we? So that's how hermeneutically we need to take that miracle and understand Jesus is still talking to us today. How many times did he, I don't remember how many times he said, if you, he that has ears, let him what does that mean? It means a lot of people hear, but they don't hear. They hear, but they don't understand. And uh, that can be irritating and it be, can be sad. But I, I wanted to share a couple things with you so that you could understand what the Bible is teaching us today. And so I've, I've written down some things that I use for some studies, some tools that I use. So you might want to write these down on that sheet someplace. Um, when we study the Bible, we know what's going to happen if we don't study. We won't have faith. But there's ways of looking at the Bible and understanding the tools of the trade, the tools of Bible study. So write these down. And some of you already have these. I use a lot of commentaries. Uh, these commentaries are usually made up of individuals who spent their whole life studying one book in the Bible. I had a professor at Harding. His name was W.B. West. He spent his whole life studying Revelation. And W.B. West, he had so many books. He made us students carry his books from his study to his home because he had built a wing on his, built on his house. This one room, all it had, all the shelves were covered with Revelations. Books on Revelation from all the commentaries. And he saturated his life on Revelation. And so there are people that spend their whole life on one book. Just studying one book. So it would be good for us to take those books and read them um, carefully. But some commentaries that you might use that I've used that I really like are The Gospel Advocate, in which uh, there's some great writers, Guy and Woods and Shepherd and Lipscomb and, and others that have written some amazing commentaries on the, on the New Testament. Uh, Barnes Notes is an amazing set of commentaries. Pulpit commentaries are amazing. I mean, they've taken every verse in the Bible and in the pulpit commentaries, which is about this long, um, 
They've written sermons on every verse in the Bible. Can you imagine? The pulpit commentaries are amazing. And then there's also uh, Johnson Notes. Now, Johnson's Notes is one volume of a commentary on the whole Bible. It's really a good uh, volume. And also uh, Kaufman's commentaries. Brother Kaufman just died a few years ago. He spent his whole life, he finished his commentaries on the Bible. He's out of Texas, but they're irreplaceable. They're, they're amazing. They're classics. Kaufman's commentaries. Deal and Kellich is a very good series. Um, Haley's Handbook is a very good book to have. Haley's Handbook was the first commentary we had in our house when I was growing up in Michigan. That's the first book I got to know. And Brother Haley passed away about 25 years ago. Uh, then the Zondervan Handbook. Have any of you ever seen the Zondervan Handbook? They have a new edition now. It's really good. It not only gives you comments on Scripture, but it takes you over to Israel, and you can see the places where all these stories took place. And they're pretty accurate on those places in the Holy Land where they took place because Constantine sent his mother over to the Holy Land to locate where Jesus was born in 300 A.D., 300 years after what happened in the Holy Land. And they, she found out the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where he was crucified. She found out, you know, where uh, it was that Jesus healed the blind man, the Pool of Siloam. She found out where he healed the paralyzed man, the Pool of Bethesda. So she was able to locate where all the... You can literally stand in the fifth portico where Jesus healed the man, told him, pick up, pick up your mat and walk, and he walked away. You can literally stand. This is where Jesus stood 2,000 years ago, right near the fourth, fifth portico, and they built a St. Anne's church next to it, of course. Russ, what was the name of the last name? What's that? Zandervan? Z-A-N-D-Z-O-N-D-E-R-V-A-N. Zondervan's Handbook to the Bible. I think, I think there's a really new uh, contemporary version of that, too. The concordance always helps me find verses. If I can't find a verse, I know I can look it up in a concordance and find out where that verse is. Um, expository dictionaries, they define the biblical terminology. So if you want to know the, the, the meaning of Sabbath uh, or the phylacteries that they wore, if you want to know any of the tassels on their garments, you can look it up in the biblical terminology. They're called expository dictionaries of the Bible. You probably have some of those. Uh, so those are the things that I use for my tools. And, and uh, if you have any questions about those, I'll talk to you about them after class. But we do need to look at this and understand what we're talking about. Uh, a man tried to sell me a coffin one time, and I told him, I said... That's the last thing I need. You'll get it later on the way home. Scott got it. Um, but the last thing we need is the first thing in Bible study, and that is some time. We need time. Uh, we need time to look at the Bible. So I want you to look at your outline there that's in front of you. And I want you to look at this outline. See, we have to know what the origin of the Bible is. And we know, letter A, that it was a divine source. The Bible came from God. Put that down. It came from God, but letter B, there were human writers. So it came from God, but there were human writers, and we have to keep that in mind. God did not come down to earth and write the Holy Scriptures for us. He wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger in Mount Sinai. But the Scripture was given to man uh, what does he say in 2 Peter uh, 1, 20 and 21? Knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the Scripture came by the interpretation of man, but the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So in 2 Timothy and Peter, they're telling us, this, this is from God. The Spirit talked to them so that they could write this down. So when we look at this, I, I want you to see how we got the Bible and understand what we're talking about. Divine source, the Bible came from God, and they had human writers. So, number one, under B, God used 40 men in the writing of the Bible. The 40 worked about 1,500 years, 
from 1400 BC to 100 AD. And so we have to have a discussion of what BC and AD, uh, Anno Domini, which is Latin, it doesn't say 100 AD, it says 100 Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. The year of our Lord is Anno Domini in Latin. And that's why you see AD after our date. This is 2023 AD, Anno Domini. Um, now, AC, then what the Jewish people use is BCE and ACE. They don't want to admit that Jesus is responsible for our calendar. So they'll say, uh, instead of 100 AD, they'll say 100 ACE, after the Common Era. After the Common Era. Or instead of 1500 BC or 1400 BC, they'll say 1400 BCE, before the Common Era. So they don't want to admit that Jesus is the Messiah. So they'll stay away from that. And I just turned this off, I think. I hit the button on the side like Kathleen told me not to do. Thank you, Kathleen. Sorry. Oh, there we go. So some wrote what God had told them, as Moses did it in Deuteronomy 31. And so we know who the writers were. We know that the... That, uh, that Moses wrote these because Jesus said he wrote them. He gave him the credit, didn't he? Moses wrote, Moses wrote, Moses said, Moses said. He wrote it down in Deuteronomy chapter 31. But we also know that Deuteronomy doesn't end in chapter 31, verse 24. In the last chapter, Moses dies. He can't write the last chapter of Deuteronomy if he's dead, can he? Shake your head no. So somebody wrote the last chapters of Deuteronomy. They think it was Joshua, because he's next in line. He's the next commander of Israel. So it probably was Moses, and then maybe Joshua, or maybe one of the high priests. But some wrote what, they've been, what they had seen in Matthew. Some recorded what they had heard from others, like in Luke chapter 2, when it says at the end of the chapter, after they went back and got Jesus out of Jerusalem, what did it say? Mary treasured all of these things up in her heart. How did Luke know that? He interviewed Mary. He had to, to get that, or the Holy Spirit put it in his hand. But we know that they wrote that, and they interviewed people. So they believe that Luke probably interviewed not only Mary, but other people as well, like Peter. Some use earlier writings, 1 Samuel 1.18, if you read 118, you'll see that, uh, in fact, somebody turn over there quickly. 1 Samuel 118, I want you to, to see what uh, they recorded for us. The Lord recorded this for us. And who has it? Somebody read it. Who's got it? Anybody? Okay, Joe. She said, Maybe Real loud. So. Verse Samuel 118, she said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Okay, who's that talking about? Maybe I gave you the wrong verse. Yeah, like second, Samuel. second Samuel. Oh, okay. There it is, Second Samuel over here. It doesn't quite get on this yeah. screen. Oh, yeah. That's it's cool. close. It's real close. Okay, the, the book of Jasher evidently is a lost book about battles of Israel. And the Lord must have thought, well, they don't need to read about these battles. So we don't know where the book of Jasher is. We know they knew it back then, but we don't know it. So evidently God doesn't feel we need to read about the battles. But that's one of the things that's mentioned in the Bible, the lost book. But all writers were guided by the Holy Spirit. They were called inspired men. Write that down in your notes. Make sure you fill this in. Inspired men. And we've got seven minutes left. Oh, I've got to hurry here. Uh, so the word inspiration or thought inspiration is what is argued about today. And you'll go to seminars where they say, well, I want to have a Bible that's word inspired. I want a Bible that's word inspiration not thought inspiration. The New International Version is more of a thought inspiration. 
the scholars on the committees that, that uh, were able to translate the New International Version, they would take a phrase and they would try to interpret that and transcribe it and interpret it so that they took that thought and interpreted that into English. The word inspiration is the scholars try to take every single Greek word and translate it into English. And every Hebrew word in the Old Testament and translate that into English. Now, the thought, the thought inspiration or word inspiration is much more tedious. When you're taking every single word and translating it into English, it's a lot more work intensive but I think it might be a little more uh, accurate than thought inspiration, taking one verse and saying, well, this is what it meant, you know, and putting it in our own words. I think there can be some danger. There's a book out called uh, Good News for Modern Man. Uh, Peterson, one man, interpreted, uh, translated from the, Hebrew, uh, from the Greek into English. To me, that's dangerous to have one person translate what they want to say in the New Testament. So we have to be very careful about that. You want to buy a Bible that has a committee, right? Not just one person. So uh, there's a difference between word inspiration and thought inspiration. All you have to do is read the introduction or the preface in the Bible to see what kind of Bible you have. And I would encourage you to buy a Bible that has a big committee and from different nations, different churches, uh, when you're reading that, that translation in your lap. So the purpose of this lesson is we do not have a single book in the handwriting of Paul, Moses, and Isaiah. How do we know the Bible we have is the word written by the original writers? Wouldn't that be good to know? Now, I've heard uh, when I was in the University of Michigan, they have a, a library there and they have a vault room. The vault room contains the greatest collection of manuscripts and scrolls from the Holy Land in the Western Hemisphere. Now, the museum of, uh, the British Museum has the greatest collection of manuscripts and scrolls in the world. So Michigan, University of Michigan says, we have the greatest collection of scrolls and manuscripts in the Western Hemisphere. It really sounds impressive, but then the British Museum says, we have the greatest in the world. So they brag about their collection of scrolls and manuscripts and the University of Michigan has to brag about theirs as well. So they have their own bragging rights. But I, every time I take a group, when I took groups of ministers to University of Michigan to look at these old manuscripts and, and, uh, and uh, manuscripts and scrolls, I always tell them, okay, this year, they're one year older than the ones we saw last year. <laughs> so every year we go, they're a little older. Uh, we actually got to see some manuscripts and scrolls from the New Testament. And they're hard to read because some of them, a lot of them were written on papyrus, and they're not destroyed, but they're getting old, and they're hard to read. Um, they actually, in the vault room in the University of Michigan, they have an original King James Version sitting out on a table. They don't let it go flat. They have it up like this, and uh, it has a sign that says, Do not touch. But when they were looking away, I touched it, so... I think the acid from my fingers is eating away at, as we speak. <laughs> the only guy, no, all my fault. I'm the only one that broke the law at the University of Michigan at that time. But they do have a lot of Old Testament scrolls, or New Testament scrolls. Now the problem is, how do we know we don't have an original writing by Paul? Or Moses or Isaiah? Nobody, when Paul was done writing a letter... Nobody sat there and put original copy. We don't know. We probably have copies of the original, and we also have some copies of the copies of the original. But that's what we have to remember. We have to trust that the scribes who copied these were going to be uh, the kind of professionals that we could trust. And I'll get to that in just a few moments. God did not inspire all who copied or translated the Bible. He inspired the writers, but what about the people that copied or translated the Bible as he did the original writers so that they could not make mistakes? It is evident both the copyists and the translators could and did make mistakes. 
They did. We can't say that the King James uh, people that, that printed the King James and uh, typeset the King James or printed the New International Version or whatever translation, whatever version you're talking about, they're not inspired. They made mistakes. They still make mistakes. But we have to trust that we have a good copy in our hands, and we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But I want my students to know that the version that they're carrying around may have some mistakes in it, and we'll talk about that. Let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 1 and uh, just try to examine one of these. Uh, let's go to Genesis 1. Scott, do you have that? Genesis 126 for me, please. Oh, we're run we got one minute left. Hurry, Scott. <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals. Okay, now listen to what his command is. Skip down to verse 28. This is the first command. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill okay, the so the first order from God is, Be fruitful and increase in numbers. Does anybody have a different translation? What does your say, George? That just says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule okay, so what we're reading there is different from the King James Version. The King James Version says, be fruitful and replenish the earth. Well, what's the difference between filling the earth and replenishing the earth? Rick? Multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. And increase in number or replenish the earth. Replenish is not the word that should have been translated by King James's 53 scholars. It should say, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. In a, in, a, in a gas station in Israel, you don't say replenish, you say mala, which means fill. Fill my tank up. Uh, so we're not replenishing the earth. The replenishing notates that there were people here before Adam and Eve, and then he started over, and he's saying, okay, let's start over. That's not right. And, and also in the New International Version, in Isaiah 14, in the New International Version, it calls Mary a maiden instead of a virgin. And that's a mistake. The Hebrew says she was a virgin, not a maiden. And the definition of vir virgin and, mar and maiden have changed over the centuries. Last word, Rick. Yeah, I um, was thinking about your lesson from last week when we talked about mocking or laughing, etc. And all of the versions are incorrect. Yep. So is there a correct version out there you're recommending? Uh, we're going to get to that. He's put me on the spot here. Uh, every version has a mistake in it. But they're so tiny, I wouldn't worry about it. I can use any version to study with people. So we're going to talk about that next week. Okay, we're out of time. Somebody draw a line. Where did we leave off? What number? Number two, we, that's as far as we got? Okay, we're going to have to hustle next week. Um, somebody draw a line under number two. I don't have a pencil with me. We'll pick up there next week. Uh, do you see how important it is to know where the Bible came from? To be able to discuss it and talk about it intelligently? Um, that's what God would want us to do. So we have plenty of tools to do that. Let's, let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we're, we're grateful for the word that's been delivered into our hands. We trust, Father, that you had a message for us, and we trust that you have arranged not only traditional but reliable Bibles that we can study from. And we thank you, Father, for doing that. Be with us as we study next week and finish talking about how we got the Bible through the centuries. And we pray this in Jesus' name.